The Quran, Dajjal, and the Jasad by Imran and Hussein. Chapter 1 Introducing the Jasad and the method of study of the subject. Even though this subject of the Jasad, who was shown sitting on Solomon's throne, alayhi salam, was already addressed in our book entitled Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwal al Zaman we nevertheless felt it necessary to return to the subject in this new book in order to explain it again, both in greater detail as well as in the simplest way possible. We have done so for several reasons, the first of which is our view that the subject of the Jasad poses the supreme test concerning proper methodology for study of the Qur'an, our Shia, Salafi, Brelvi, Diobandi brothers, as well as those who control institutions of higher Islamic learning known as the Darul Uloom and Jami'a, need to be reminded that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared, I leave behind me two weighty things. Ana tarikun fikum thaqalain. Awwaluhuma kitabullah. Thumma qal, وَأَهْلِ بَيْتِي أُذَكِّرُكُمُ اللَّهَ فِي أَهْلِ بَيْتِي أُذَكِّرُكُمُ اللَّهَ فِي أَهْلِ بَيْتِي I leave with you two weighty things. The first is the book of Allah, in which there is right guidance and light. So hold fast to the book of Allah. And then he said, The second is the members of my household. I remind you to be kind to the members of my family. I remind you to be kind to the members of my family. Sahih al-Muslim There can be no doubt at all about the fact that absolute truth is located only in the Qur'an. Hence, the Qur'an is the supreme guide for all those who belong to the Ummah of Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this includes his own family and hence the reason why the Prophet urged his followers to hold fast to the Qur'an. Since the Qur'an occupies such a preeminent position in the religion of Islam, the credentials of all the sects mentioned above must be assessed on the basis of the standard of knowledge of the Qur'an. Since the jasad is located in the Qur'an, those Islamic sectarian movements would have to inform us, correctly so, who is the jasad? We have no desire whatsoever to provide in this book a comprehensive record of scholarly views expressed in explaining this supremely important verse of the Qur'an. Rather, we leave this subject to a future scholar of Islam who will conduct independent research with scholarly integrity, without fear or favour, and publish the results of his research for the benefit of our readers both Shia as well as Sunni, both Salafi as well as Sufi. We have also returned to this subject in this book because scant attention has been devoted to the Jasad who was cast on the throne of Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam. As a consequence, it is a new and unknown subject to most readers who therefore have to adjust to the shock of new knowledge before they could even make an effort to understand the subject. Finally, we have returned to this subject of the jasad because it has provoked, all through our history, an enormous amount of confusion of scholarly thought. The need, therefore, existed to bring clarity to the subject, and we hope that this has been achieved once and for all times in this humble book. Our view is that Solomon's vision, alayhi salam, disclosed in the Qur'an, Surah Sa'd, Chapter 38, verses 34 to 35, of a jasad who was shown to him sitting on his throne is the most direct reference to Dajjal to be found in the Qur'an. If the jasad is indeed Dajjal, then this passage of the Qur'an would qualify as the very key which unlocks the knowledge of this supremely important subject of Dajjal, the false messiah, or Antichrist. The cattle would ask, because cattle have no knowledge, 
Why is the subject of Dajjal so important? The answer is that Dajjal poses the greatest danger that mankind would face in all of human history. وعن عمران بن حسين رضي الله عنهما قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول ما بين خلق آدم إلى قيام الساعة أمر أكبر من الدجال عمران بن حسين reported I heard the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم saying between time of the creation of Adam and the resurrection day there is no greater trial no greater danger than that of Dajjal, the Antichrist. Sahih al-Muslim Imam Muslim also reports that Dajjal will pose a danger to mankind in all parts of the world, except Mecca and Yathrib. لَيْسَ مِنْ بَلَدٍ إِلَّا سَيَطَأُهُ Dajjal. Sahih al-Muslim We addressed this subject of Dajjal, the Jasad, in our book, entitled Dajjal, the Qur'an, and Awwal al-Zaman, but found surprisingly so that the world of Islamic scholarship did not deem it of any importance to respond to that book. This book is therefore also written to provoke, gently so, those who are so troubled by our scholarship that they have problems in opening the doors of the masjid, particularly in the UK, for us to teach the book of Allah Most High, if our views expressed in this book are wrong, then we invite them to explain what is right. If they persist in closing the doors of the masjid to us, while remaining incapable or unwilling to respond to this book, their shallow and inadequate scholarship will be exposed. The challenge of this book is located, of course, in the methodology which should be adopted for study of the Qur'an. And the challenge is offered because this writer is becoming increasingly convinced that there are many who are today recognized by the masses as ulama or religious scholars of Islam, but who do not really study the Qur'an. We seek nothing more than to provoke them to think, and as a consequence, to study the Book of Allah as it ought to be studied. This book is written with the absolute conviction that truth must always eventually prevail. If we are wrong in our explanation of the blessed Qur'an, then it will be only a matter of time before our scholarship is forgotten. But if we are correct in explaining the Qur'an, then those who close the doors of the masjid to us would have committed a grievous wrong. The Qur'an has not only disclosed that Allah Most High tested Solomon, i.e. Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, Surah Al-Sad, chapter 38, verse 34, when he cast a jesed on his throne, but that Solomon, who was the wisest of all men, promptly understood the vision and swiftly responded to it. In the very next verse of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Sad, chapter 38, verse 35, we are informed of that response in which Solomon made a prayer to Allah Most High, to grant that none should inherit his kingdom, i.e. the holy state of Israel, after him. As soon as Solomon salam died, the holy state of Israel collapsed into civil war and was broken into two. It has never since been revived. Since none has inherited his kingdom after him, it is clear that Allah Most High accepted Solomon's prayer salam and granted his request. This book is devoted to a study of that jasad and of Solomon's response to the vision and our primary objective in writing this book is to demonstrate the application of proper methodology for study of the Qur'an. Proper methodology in this particular matter concerning the jasad requires us to ask the question why did Solomon salam respond to the vision in the manner in which he did? Why did he make the prayer that none should inherit his kingdom after him? Since the Qur'an does not explain who that jasad was, nor is there any real explanation in the hadith of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and since these two primary sources do not truly explain why Solomon alayhi salam responded to the vision in the manner that he did, 
commentators of the Qur'an, including classical commentators, have constantly offered their own opinions on the subject. They have also done so in the matter concerning Solomon's death, of which the jinn were unaware, in consequence of which they continued to work until Dabatul Ard consumed something connected to Solomon's staff, and only then did the jinn realize that he was dead. Our learned assistant, Hasbullah Shafi'i, has kindly compiled for the benefit of our readers a summary of views on both subjects found in many of those commentaries. The summaries are included in this book as Appendices 1 and 2. We felt, however, that it would benefit our readers if in addition to the summaries provided in those two appendices, we were to provide the views of the Jasad as well as of Dabbatul Ard of four recent Islamic scholars, all of whom wrote commentaries of the Qur'an. Three of those scholars, Abu al-A'la Maududi, Amin Ahsan Islahi, and Muhammad Ali, resided in the famous Pakistani city of Lahore. And the fourth, Muhammad Asad, was a European Jew who joined the community of believers who followed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have included Muhammad Ali since the Ahmadiyya movement of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, to which he belonged, presented a formidable eschatological challenge to the entire world of Islam. Hence, it is important for readers to be exposed to Ahmadiyya scholarship on these two supremely important subjects. Proper methodology for study of the Qur'an requires that when Allah and His Messenger have explained any verse of the Qur'an, then such explanation must be recognized as the last word on that subject. However, when neither Allah nor His Messenger have effectively explained a verse of the Qur'an, then opinions expressed, even in the classical commentaries of the Qur'an, can never function as the last word in explanation of such a verse of the Holy Book. Rather, each believer must exert himself and herself to study the Qur'an with a view to eventually reach that stage of scholarly effort when he or she can seek to penetrate and understand verses of the Qur'an. It is at that stage of scholarly effort that verses such as Surah Tusad chapter 38 verses 34 to 35 can be studied on the basis of independent effort. It is not at all proper or correct that a scholarly effort at understanding and explaining verses of the Qur'an should be confined to a word processing exercise in studying explanations in the books of tafsir. We intend to demonstrate in this book, insha'Allah, that there is knowledge and explanations of the Qur'an which are located beyond the commentaries and only those who exert themselves to think can be blessed to extend the frontiers of knowledge of the Qur'an. The Salafi Muslim is therefore obliged by this methodology of study of the Qur'an and Hadith, which admits of no new interpretative explanation of either the Qur'an or Hadith, to accept that he will never know who or what was that jasad. Our methodology for the study of the Qur'an and Hadith is different. When there is no real explanation, the implication is that we must exert ourselves to think and to thus seek to penetrate the subject in order to understand it. We commence our study of the jasad by first reminding the gentle reader that the Qur'an declares of itself that it has two kinds of verses. Indeed, this must also be true of all other revealed scriptures since they all came from the same divine source. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هو الذي أنزل عليك الكتاب منه آيات محكمات هن أم الكتاب وأخر متشابهات فأما الذين في قلوبهم زيغ فيتبعون ما تشابه منه ابتغاء الفتنة وابتغاء تأويله وما يعلم تأويله إلا الله والراسخون في العلم يقولون آمنا به كل من عند ربنا وما يذكر إلا أولو الألباب The Holy Quran, Surah Al Imran, Chapter 3, Verse 7 He it is who has bestowed upon you from on high this book or scripture 
containing ayat muhkamat, i.e. verses that are clear in and by themselves. And these verses constitute the heart or essence of the book, as well as other verses known as ayat mutashabihat, which are allegorical and hence have to be interpreted in order to be understood. Those whose hearts are crooked and corrupted go after that part of the book which has been expressed in allegory while seeking to misguide and to confuse. In the process, they create sectarian movements with which they corrupt the beliefs of the believers. It is because of the crookedness in their hearts that they seek to locate the interpretation of the allegorical verses in an arbitrary manner. Since none but Allah knows their meaning, it follows that only Allah can confirm that an interpretation of such verses is correct. Those who are deeply rooted in knowledge behave differently. They do not engage these verses in an arbitrary manner. Rather they say, we believe in the allegorical verses and we study them with a methodology which recognizes that all verses in the Qur'an, both those which are allegorical as well as those which are plain and clear, have come from the Divine Presence. Hence, if the allegorical verses are to be interpreted, the Qur'an has to be studied as a harmonious, integrated whole, and not in disparate, disjointed parts. But none will study the allegorical verses in the proper way, save those who are endowed with clarity of thought and with insight. Surah to Ali Imran, Chapter 3, Verse 7 Since neither the Qur'an nor the Hadith has clearly explained who or what is the jasad, the implication is that we have to recognize these verses of the Qur'an as ayat mutashabihat, or verses which have to be studied and interpreted in order to be understood. Our readers are reminded that Allah Most High has repeatedly declared that He sent the Qur'an to people who think, ponder, and reflect. كَذَلِكَ يُبَيِّنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمُ الْآيَاتِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ In this way does Allah make clear unto you His verses so that you might think and reflect over them. Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 219 أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Will they not then think, ponder and reflect over this Qur'an? Had it issued from any but Allah, they would surely have found in it many an inner contradiction. Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 82. كَذَلِكَ نُفَصِّلُ الْآيَاتِ لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Thus clearly do we spell out these messages of knowledge and of guidance unto people who think. Surah Yunus, chapter 10. Verse 24 كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ إِلَيْكَ مُبَارَكٌ لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُو الْأَلْبَابِ All this we have expounded in this blessed divine writ, which we have revealed unto you, so that men may ponder and reflect over its verses, and that those who are endowed with insight may so penetrate their meaning that they may take them to heart. Surah Sad, Chapter 38, Verse 29 أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا What is wrong with them? Why do they not ponder and reflect over this Qur'an? Or are there locks upon their hearts? Surah Muhammad, chapter 47, verse 24 The Qur'an warns that those who do not think have a terrible status with Allah. إِنَّ الشَّرَّ الدَّوَابِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ السُّمُّ الْبُكْمُ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Verily, the most despicable of all creatures in the sight of Allah are those deaf and dumb ones who do not use their rational faculty. Surah Al-Anfal, chapter 8, verse 22. People have to think in order to study the Qur'an, precisely because there is knowledge in the Qur'an which cannot be accessed by any except those who think. The art of thinking requires that both the rational faculty as well as internal intuitive insight must be employed, harmoniously so, to reach what the Qur'an describes as Majma'ul Bahrain, i.e. 
the place where the two oceans of knowledge, i.e. the internal and the external, meet. Only thus can the ayat mutashabihat of the Qur'an be penetrated and understood. It is precisely because today's Darul Ulum no longer invites students to think and ponder over the Qur'an while studying it that the graduates of the Darul Ulum do not have a clue of what the Qur'an has offered that explains the strange and mysterious reality of the world today. In fact, if a student dares to think, he might be expelled from the Darul Ulum. This dangerous Darul Ulum defect in the methodology for the study of the Qur'an must be recognized as the greatest obstacle that now prevents the world of Islamic scholarship from emerging from the stagnant intellectual abyss into which it fell many moons ago. The Salafi methodology, on the other hand, insists that all knowledge of the Qur'an has already been explained by the Blessed Prophet and the early Muslims, i.e. the Aslaf, and that no new knowledge from the Qur'an is possible. Why then, we ask our Salafi brothers, should Allah Most High declare that He sent the Qur'an to people who think? How then, we ask, will we ever be able to find in the Qur'an that which explains the reality of a modern world dominated by a mysterious and godless modern Western civilization which emerged from the corrupted bosom of that part of the Christian world which broke away from Constantinople. Those Christians who headed westwards were tested by Allah Most High and they failed the test when they abandoned the sacred law and went fishing on the Sabbath day in violation of the law of the Sabbath. Allah Most High then sent against them both Dajjal, the false messiah, as well as Gog and Magog. وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكَ لَيَبْعَثَنَّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ مَنْ يَسُومُهُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ لَسَرِيعُ الْإِقَابِ وَإِنَّهُ لَغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ And lo, your Lord God has declared that he is now going to send against them, i.e. a people who abandon the sacred law in the Torah, those who will afflict them continuously until the last day with cruel suffering, Verily your Lord God is swift in retribution, yet verily he is also much forgiving, a dispenser of grace. Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 167. We must think in order to penetrate the Qur'an. Our readers must be reminded that Allah Most High has sent the Qur'an to a people who would think in such a way as to seek to penetrate the inner meanings of the Qur'an. إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْمُتَوَسِّمِينَ Verily, in all this, there is knowledge for those who can read the signs. Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verse 75. Muhammad Asad comments on this verse as follows. In its full significance, the term mutawassimin denotes one who applies his mind to the study of the outward appearance of a thing with a view to understanding its real nature and its inner characteristics, the Makhshari and Razi. It should be as plain as daylight to those who think that Allah Most High sent the ayat mutashabihat of the Qur'an so that the believers would be forced to think in order to so penetrate them that they might be understood. The believers are obliged to do so, even though Allah Most High has declared that he alone can confirm that an interpretation of the Qur'an is correct. There are several implications which emerge from the above verse of the Qur'an. The first and most important is that if the ayat mutashabihat are to be ever penetrated and correctly understood, the Qur'an must be studied as a harmonious and integrated whole and not as disparate parts. Indeed, Allah Most High has specifically condemned those who break up the Qur'an into disparate parts, since such a methodology will never deliver the endless knowledge and wisdom that the Qur'an has to offer. كما أنزلنا على المقتسمين الذين جعلوا القرآن عظيم فوربك لنسألنهم أجمعين عما كانوا يعملون Previous revelations suffered the fate of being broken into parts, 
and now even with this Qur'an as well, they seek to shred it into parts. But by thy Lord God, on the day of judgment, we shall indeed call them to account, one and all, for whatever they have done. Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verses 90 to 93. The second implication is that the student must never approach the ayat mutashabihat of the Qur'an in search of interpretations which can be used to support his sectarian agenda. Not only would such a methodology fail to deliver the correct interpretation of such verses, but in addition, such a student would commit an act of disrespect to the Qur'an. This book advises those who identify with sectarian movements that they should desist from approaching the Qur'an in search of that which they can use to support their sectarian agenda. In other words, when a believer approaches the Qur'an in order to study it, he must shed his sectarian identity and study it as a plain and simple Muslim. Only such a student can successfully study the Qur'an. This writer offers a gentle challenge to those who defend that Salafi methodology and hence obliged to look for an explanation of the jasad in the Qur'an who sits on Solomon's throne alayhi salam through a methodology that is different from that used in this book to respond to the views herein expressed concerning the jasad. This writer also asks, why has the Darul Ulum also abandoned the serious study of the Qur'an? Where is the evidence that graduates of the Darul Ulum are ever invited to think and ponder over the Qur'an in the process of truly studying the book? The sad reality is that they graduate from the Darul Ulum bereft of knowledge of even the methodology for study of the Qur'an. This book is therefore written with the specific purpose of inviting, respectfully so, a scholarly response to our views expressed on this subject of the jasad from those who defend the Salafi methodology as well as from those who defend the method by which the Qur'an is taught and studied in the Darul Ulum. Chapter 2 who is Dajjal, the false messiah or antichrist? Since the true messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem and hence from a successor state to the holy state of Israel that was established by the prophet David, i.e. Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, and Solomon, i.e. Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, the inescapable implication is that Dajjal, the evil being, would seek to rule the world from Jerusalem while ruling over a state of Israel which would be presented, falsely so, as the holy state of Israel of David and Solomon alayhim as -salam. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam referred to him as Al-Masih al-Dajjal. As a consequence, we know that he is an evil being who wants to impersonate the true Messiah, Jesus the son of the Virgin Mary, alayhim as -salam. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam also prophesied that when Jesus returns to this world, he would return as a just ruler. لا تقوم الساعة حتى ينزل فيكم ابن مريم حكما مقصطا The hour will not be established until the son of Mary descends amongst you as a just ruler. Sahih al-Bukhari Our view is that Jesus cannot rule from other than a holy state, otherwise known as a Khilafah state, and such a holy state would have to be established in Jerusalem. The Qur'an has referred to a great holy state or kingdom that Allah Most High ordained for the Israelite people who were the progeny of Abraham, i.e. Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. أَمْ يَحْسُدُونَ النَّاسَ عَلَى مَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ فَقَدْ آتَيْنَا آلَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا Do they perchance envy other people for what Allah has granted them out of his bounty? But then we did grant revelation and wisdom unto the house of Abraham and we did bestow on them a mighty kingdom or state known as Holy Israel. Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 54. The Qur'an again referred to that kingdom 
over which Nabi Dawood ruled and disclosed that Allah Most High strengthened it. وَشَدَدَنَا مُلْكَهُ وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْحِكْمَةَ وَفَصْلَ الْخِطَابِ And we strengthened his kingdom or state known as Holy Israel and bestowed upon him wisdom and sagacity in judgment. Surah Tusad, chapter 38, verse 20 Since the true Messiah will rule the world from Jerusalem and hence from a holy state comparable to Holy Israel that was established by the prophets David السلام, and Solomon السلام, the inescapable implication is that Dajjal, the evil being, would have to seek to rule the world from Jerusalem while ruling over a great state of Israel, which would be presented, falsely so, as the holy state of Israel of David and Solomon السلام. We have explained this subject in several of our books on Islamic eschatology, for example, Jerusalem in the Qur'an, Dajjal, the Qur'an, and Awwal al-Zaman, etc. Hence, if Dajjal is to successfully impersonate the true Messiah, he would have to rule over a holy state which would have to be located in Jerusalem. Let us now examine the passage of the Qur'an to determine the implications of the divine vision presented to Solomon alayhis salam, in which he saw a jasad sitting on his throne. وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّا سُلَيْمَانَ وَأَلْقَيْنَا عَلَىٰ كُرْسِيهِ جَسَدًا ثُمَّ أَنَابٍ قَالَ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ لِي وَهَبْ لِي مُلْكًا لَا يَنْبَغِي لِأَحَدٍ مِّنْ بَعْدِي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَّابِ Indeed, we tested and tried Solomon when we placed a jasad upon his throne, and thereupon he turned towards us, Penitently, and he prayed, O my Lord God, kindly forgive me my sins and grant that none can inherit my kingdom of holy Israel after me. Verily, you alone are the one who can grant such a request. Surah Tusad, chapter 38, verses 34 to 35. It should be clear to the gentle reader that Solomon alayhi salam recognized two things in this vision. Firstly, that the Jesed was a truly evil being. Secondly, that the evil Jesed wanted to inherit his kingdom of holy Israel. Solomon's distress, alayhi salam, over this vision was so great, and so too his absolute rejection of any possibility that the Jesed could ever succeed in his mission to rule over holy Israel, that he immediately made a prayer to Allah Most High to grant that none should ever be able to inherit his kingdom after him. Hence, he preferred that holy Israel should perish, rather than the possibility should exist that it could ever be inherited by that evil jesed. Who could that jesed be who was shown to Solomon salam, sitting on his throne? The next chapter attempts to answer this supremely important question. Chapter 3 who was the Jesed sitting on Solomon's throne? As a consequence of using our methodology for the study of the Qur'an, we have recognized the Jesed who was shown to Solomon salam, sitting on his throne to be Dajjal, the false Messiah, and Allah knows best. Our view is that Dajjal, the Jesed, does not have the same ruh or spirit that human beings have, and this is what has made him a Jesed and Allah knows best. When Moses السلام, was called upon to climb Mount Sinai to meet with Allah Most High, someone known as the Samiri, who appears to have a PhD in engineering, requested the Israelites to hand over to him all their gold. He then forged a golden calf and presented it to the Israelites, who promptly declared that this was their God and the God of Moses. He did such an excellent job in forging the calf that when the wind blew, the calf would moo in much the same way that a living cow would moo. فَأَخْرَجَ لَهُمْ عِجَلًا جَسَدًا لَهُ خُوَارٍ فَقَالُوا هَذَا إِلَاهُكُمْ وَإِلَاهُ مُوسَى فَنَسِي Then he brought out of the fire before the people a calf that was a jesed. It seemed too low, so they said, This is your God and the God of Moses. But Moses has forgotten. Surah Taha, 
chapter 20, verse 88. The Qur'an declared of that golden calf that it was a jasad, i.e. a lifeless body or a body without a soul. In the case of the vision, however, Solomon salam could not have seen a calf sitting on his throne. Rather, it had to be a human being, since only a human being could seek to inherit his kingdom. The Qur'an also referred to a jasad as a body which does not consume food. وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا لَا يَأْكُلُونَ الطَّعَامَ وَمَا كَانُوا خَالِدِينَ Neither did we endow them with bodies that could dispense with food, nor were they immortal. Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse 8. A jasad who sits on Solomon's throne, alayhi salam, and who is perceived by Solomon as someone who wants to inherit his kingdom, has to be a person, and not just a lifeless body. Hence, he would have to consume food. Who or what was the jasad that Allah Most High showed to Solomon alayhi salam in a vision sitting on his throne? As a consequence of using our methodology for the study of the Qur'an, we have recognized the jasad who was shown to Solomon alayhi salam sitting on his throne to be Dajjal, the false messiah, and Allah knows best. If we are correct in our interpretation, then the ayat mutashabihat concerning the jasad would qualify as the most important of all such verses in the Qur'an. This would have to be so since Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam declared that Dajjal would cause mankind to experience the greatest tests and trials from the time of Adam alayhi salam until the last day. We came to this conclusion since Dajjal is described as an evil being and because he will have to rule from Jerusalem over a state of Israel before he can claim to be the Messiah and hope that his bogus claim would be accepted by the Jews as well as by those Zionist Christians who are in alliance with the Jews. If we are wrong in our interpretation of the Jesed to be Dajjal, the false messiah, our critics must inform us who or what was the Jesed who provoked such a response from Solomon alayhi salam. What are the implications of Dajjal as a human Jesed? Since Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam declared that Dajjal would be a Jew and that he would be a young man who would be powerfully built and would have the side burns of curls which the Torah has ordered for males, the inescapable implication is that Dajjal would make his appearance as a human being. When we look at him, we would see nothing other than a human being, but we know from the Qur'an that he is a jasad. Hence the question now arises, if Dajjal is a human being and he is also a jasad, in what way? Does Dajjal differ from a normal human being? Our answer is that it can only be in respect of the Ruh or Divine Spirit which Allah Most High has breathed into every human being in consequence of which a human being can not only see and hear and display intelligence the way animals can see and hear and act intelligently but has additional sight, hearing and a rational faculty. Then he gave him form and breathed into him of his spirit. And as a consequence, he endowed you with hearing and sight and hearts with which to acquire knowledge. Yet, how seldom are you grateful? Surah Al-Sajdah, chapter 32, verse 9. The Qur'an refers to the capacity for internal sight that is located in the heart. أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبَصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Will they not travel about the earth so that their hearts might come alive and so that they might be able to hear what otherwise could not be heard? Yet verily, it is not their eyes that have become blind, but blind have become the hearts that are in their breasts. Surah Al-Hajj, chapter 22, verse 46. It also warns that Allah Most High can seal the human heart in such a way 
that the internal capacity for sight, for hearing and for internally receiving knowledge would no longer be possible. ختم الله على قلوبهم وعلى سمعهم وعلى أبصارهم غشاوة ولهم عذاب عظيم. Allah has sealed their hearts and their hearing and over their eyes is a veil and awesome suffering awaits them. Surah Al-Baqarah chapter 2 verse 7 And our view, and Allah knows best, is that Dajjal, the Jasad, does not have the same ruh or spirit that human beings have and this is what has made him a Jasad. Since the Prophet described him as an evil being, the implication is that he was created as such and therefore bears no responsibility for his deeds. He was not created as a moral being and hence his actions do not qualify as conduct. The implication is that he does not possess the freedom which human beings have for making a free choice. He does not possess a free will or a self-directed will. He also does not possess the capacity for independent thinking which human beings possess because of their creative intellect. In other words, the Jal the Jasad is externally programmed to act in the way that he does. He can be likened to an automaton externally endowed with intelligence. Further implications. The further implications in our view of our recognition of Dajjal as a Jasad is that he would attempt to transform all of mankind into Jasads like himself. The Quran warns in a warning that must be recognized to be primarily directed to those who fail to respond correctly to fitna, i.e. tests and trials posed by Dajjal, that multitudes would be reduced to a status equivalent to cattle, and that they would then be a people destined for the hellfire. When we examine the contemporary world of Islam and the almost universal negative responses to our attempt to teach and explain the reality of the world today, it should be clear that the multitudes of Muslims have already been reduced to the status of cattle. وَلَقَدْ ذَرَأْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا أُولَئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلُّ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْغَافِلُونَ And most certainly we have destined for hell huge numbers of the jinn and men who have hearts with which they fail to grasp the truth and eyes with which they fail to see, and ears with which they fail to hear. They are like cattle. Nay, they are even less conscious of the right way. It is they, they who are the true heedless. Surah Al-A'raf, chapter 7, verse 179. The Qur'an further warns those who are reduced to internal blindness and thus become jesuits like Dajjal would remain blind in the next world as well. وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي هَذِهِ أَعْمَى فَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَعْمَى وَأَضَلُّ سَبِيلًا Whoever is internally blind in this world will be blind in the life to come as well and still farther astray from the path of truth. Surah Al-Isra, chapter 17, verse 72 Whoever has eyes and yet cannot see would have become a jasad like unto Dajjal. How then does Dajjal reduce people to a state of internal blindness. How does Dajjal get people to stop thinking in consequence of which he would think for them? And how does he get people to stop using their own free will with which to make proper choices in life in consequence of which he would choose for them? We need to discover how Dajjal succeeds in getting the masses of people to dance to every tune he plays. It is therefore a matter of supreme importance to our readers that they should have some insight into the strategies which the Jal will employ in order to reduce most of mankind into jesuits like himself. And it is to this subject that we now turn. Chapter 4 How does the Jal reduce human beings into jesuits like himself? No Muslim in the modern age has demonstrated greater insight into the jesuit
than Malcolm X.